I'm really excited about this one. This is Darius Sharp. Leverages his healthcare background to understand and address pre-diabetes and heart health, participating actively in endurance sports. Please welcome Darius Sharp. Good afternoon, everyone. I first want to thank Dave for giving me the opportunity to speak here. My name is Darius. Uh, for the past six years, I've been an ER nurse. Prior to that, I was a paramedic and EMT in the 911 system for 16 years. I've always been in pretty good shape, ran track in high school, I've always worked out. Uh, over the last 10 years, I've been doing endurance events like Spartan races, marathons, half marathons. Never been overweight, really. My highest weight was 192 right at the end of nursing school after eating lots of cookies. It got me through it. I uh, lost the weight quickly. <laughs> I know. Um, I've never smoked, never drank. I haven't taken so much of the Tylenol in the past 10 years. <laughs> I know, right? DexaFit actually gives me an A plus for their body's cure, which is like the only A plus I've ever had in my life. Body fat, 13%. My visceral fat is low. My VO2 max is 52, which is a 93rd percentile for my age. So I'm pretty good shape. Except I have heart disease. I know, right? Most people look at this guy and think, uh, he's perfectly healthy, can eat whatever he wants, doesn't need to go to the doctor. But I'm a curious dude. So I decided to get a CAC scan last year, and to my surprise, my score came back at 44. Similar to Jamie's husband, I was like, what the heck is going on here? That score puts me in the 94th percentile. If I was 45, the Mesa calculator doesn't go down to 39, which is my age at the time. So what's happening? Well, conventional medicine would say that, dude, your LDLC has been 179 at least since you were 25. You should have been on the statin back then. Well, it's true. My LDLC has been very high for pretty much my whole life. Dave has given us some information recently that challenges that a bit, but I actually don't think LDLC is innocent here, and I'll get to that in a little bit. My LP little a has been high as well, but I've been able to bring it down through better glucose control, which is my primary focus here. Back in 2013, I was diagnosed as a pre-diabetic. That was based on a single fasting glucose reading of 105 at a doctor's uh, appointment. Now, was that appropriate? Mm, they should have rechecked that test. They should have done an A1C, and they should have went ahead and told me I was pre-diabetic, which they didn't. Not appropriate. However, I did go on eventually to check my A1C, and it was solidly in the pre-diabetic range, and it's remained so ever since. So what's going on? Am I insulin resistant? Hmm. Well, for those of you nerds who understand these numbers here, those are at best mild insulin resistance, and those are my worst numbers ever. The vast majority of the time over the past three years, all my numbers have been pristine, showing me to be insulin sensitive. <clears throat> Yet, my A1C still stays high. And to confirm this, my fructosamine and my glycated albumin both show that I am in the pre-diabetic range. And to confirm my bona fides as a lean mass hyper-responder, you can see my LDL is high, my HDL is high, my triglycerides are low, I'm fit, I'm lean, I'm insulin sensitive, so why the heck do I have an elevated CAC score? Well, let's take a look back. That's me back in my young stud paramedic days. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with ambulance work, basically all you do is sit around in parking lots and wait for a call. Well, what are in parking lots but all of the delicious and nutritious foods of our modern world? And I was eating all of it because, again, I was fit and in shape. Who cares, right? Eventually, I wised up, went on to nursing school. After nursing school, I stumbled across this book, Genius Foods, by Max Lugavere. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, it is a great first step into the world of nutrition science. After this, I started eating kind of a moderately low-carb diet, about 100 grams a day. wasn't counting strictly, but it was mostly whole foods based. I dropped that nursing school weight quickly, and after about a year, I was getting off work one night, and I had a hankering for some In-N-Out burger. And I was like, you know what? I've been good. I'm going to reward myself. So I went and got myself a burger, fries, and a root beer. Started driving home after eating it and started feeling like garbage. I was like, what the heck's going on? Huh, I wonder what my glucose is. Well, I get home and check my glucose about an hour drive later, and it comes back at 251. Holy crap, I thought. So if a patient comes into my ER with this, I go, what did you eat before you came in here? You're clearly diabetic. You're not taking your medications. But this was me this time, so I had to look in the mirror. Now, I went on. I decided I would do a little experiment. 
I would eliminate some of the carbs from the meal. So you can see 251 is that first reading. 204 was after eliminating the root beer. 142 after eliminating the bun, getting a lettuce wrap burger. 113 after getting two burgers, lettuce wrap, and eliminating the fries. I was like, all right, well, this looks like how I should be eating. But did I learn my lesson? No, of course not, right? I still kept eating junk. Eh, whatever, I'm in good shape, hey. Well, I wised up a little bit, decided to get a CGM last year and did some experimenting. And as you can expect, things like Pepsi, pancakes, bread, rice, those are gonna spike me high. But even things like clam chowder, coconut water, watermelon, cherries and honeydew melon, these are all whole foods, healthy sources of carbs that were spiking my glucose really high. A single banana sends me to 179 if I eat that on an empty stomach. For those of you who remember Clay, those of you in the Lean Mass Hyper Responder group, I had to get him in here. I went to visit him in the hospital shortly before he passed. And never missing an opportunity to experiment, I went and got some tacos afterwards. And as you can expect, that one's for you, Clay. So I decided to repeat that in and out experiment with the CGM and expectedly, my glucose went through the roof. Yet, it returns back down to normal within just a couple hours, showing me to be insulin sensitive. This gave me an idea. I was like, hmm, let me give myself, uh, let me try an uh, experiment here. So I did one week of keto versus one week of high carb. Keto week, 23 grams of net carbs. High carb week, 300 grams of net carbs daily on average. This is the result of that. So at the end of the keto week, I did an oral glucose tolerance test. You can see my baseline glucose was lower, but I had a higher result on the oral glucose tolerance test. High carb week, higher baseline glucose, but lower peak. So this is expected for these tests. These tests are actually designed to be done by people who are eating carbohydrates, and Ben Bickman can tell you about that. I graphed the results afterwards, and you can see keto again. Glucose was high, and my insulin had a higher peak as well. High carb week, I had a lower glucose peak and a lower insulin peak. But still, in both cases, my glucose and insulin were back down to normal in two hours. So I passed the test. I am insulin sensitive. This is a little busy, but it is the graph of my CGM during each week. First week, keto, 94 on average glucose. You can see the graph is largely flat, except for that one little peak up there towards the top, and that was a one mile time, uh, one mile time trial I did for myself. So that was purely from exercise. Now on the second week, I had a higher average glucose, but I was getting spikes all over the place. Look at this, many times above 150, many times at 180 and above. I was trying to keep my spikes minimized this time, but it was still happening. I was getting what we call postprandial hyperglycemia. And this, I believe, is not only a huge blind spot, not only in conventional medicine, but even in our space as well. Unless you have a CGM or are diligently checking your glucose after eating carbohydrates, you're not gonna see it. And this can happen even if you are fit and insulin sensitive. Now, the problems with postprandial hyperglycemia, as you can see, you're gonna have an exaggerated insulin response. You're more likely to develop type two diabetes and insulin resistance. It's actually one of the first early signs of someone who's gonna go on to develop type two diabetes. You're gonna have increased glycative damage. You're gonna have damage to your glycocalyx and your endothelium. You're gonna have reduction of your endothelial progenitor cells, which are responsible for healing your endothelium. You're gonna have activation of your polyol pathway, um, like uh, they were talking about earlier and increased fructose production. You're gonna have microvascular damage, you're gonna have glucose dumping from your kidneys leading to things like UTIs and even renal failure. And here's the big thing. You're gonna have increased glycation oxidation of your lipoproteins, of which I have a heck of a lot of. This is where I believe LDLC is not innocent. This, I believe, is the reason my CAC score was elevated. I'm getting giant glucose spikes and I have high LDL. It's glycating and modifying those particles, making them more atherogenic. Now, this is gonna be, that's a big topic and gonna be a subject of a future talk. I just don't have time for it here. Now, ultimately, I've been, I've been talking about myself this whole time, but this isn't really about me. This is about all of us. So many of us just assume that we're healthy. I get people that walk into my ER and they look unhealthy, they're obese, they look ill, they come up to me with some complaint like, oh, I, I don't know why I feel this way, I've always been so healthy. I'm like, no, 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 you haven't been healthy for a long time, man. But a lot of us assume we're healthy, I assumed I was healthy, but 
but I had a problem because I wasn't checking and conventional medicine wasn't helping me. You could have glucose problems, high blood pressure, lipid problems, things like this, and you don't know unless you check. So check. Measure your weight daily. Track your calories and macros. Get chronometer. I know people hate doing this, but you know, if you're trying to create a budget for yourself, you know what you do? You track your spending so that you see that you're spending $140 at Starbucks every month, right? Check your glucose. Get Keto Mojo. Check your ketones. Check to see if you're having postprandial glucose. Not everybody has this issue, but maybe you do, right? So check your glucose prior to a meal, 30 minutes, and one hour afterwards after eating carbs and see if you have the same problem. Experiment on yourself. Try different, uh, try different diets, try different exercise routines, and see how you feel. Get your labs done. Thank you to Dave and Shaban for Own Your Labs. It is a wonderful, wonderful resource. And it's been, yeah, big round of applause for them. And you can take those labs and you can show them to your doctor. Maybe they can order them for you, maybe they can't. But at the very least, you can work with your doctor. You can, you can show them, hey, I'm trying to improve my health. Look at these values. I know a lot of us kind of askew conventional medicine, but you know what? Bring them along with you. Show them, hey, this is what I'm doing to improve my health. Can you help me? And they might actually be a lot more amenable to the things that you're doing. But ultimately, don't rely entirely upon them. Your health is your responsibility, so own it. Care about your future self. So many people I see come into my ER and are sick and are dying, and I'm giving them medications, I'm thumping on their chest, and I'm watching their family members cry over their dead loved one who died decades before they should have. And this is where I get passionate, because we in conventional medicine have failed them. People come in on dialysis, diabetes completely out of control, all these problems that could have been resolved had we just checked earlier, had we given them good guidance. These are people who are suffering and that we can help, and that's where my passion lies, and that's really why I am up here. Now, what's ahead for me? Ultimately, I want to repeat this clearly. I want to repeat that CT scan with clearly to see if I have any soft plaque. I'm going to get a CIMT done. I'm going to keep on working to bring my A1C and my LP little A down. Like I said before, I was m more on like a low carb diet. I've switched to keto recently. I've done things like used, uh, started on K2 and vitamin D. I'm looking to starting on vitamin C as well. I'm going to keep experimenting with my CGM, and I'm going to keep investigating the, post, the impact of postprandial hyperglycemia on health, because again, I think it is a huge, huge blind spot in both conventional medicine and even here. And finally, I'm going to continue to educate my patients, my coworkers, and the public about what I've learned. I have learned so much from many of you in this audience, and I just want to do my part to give back and contribute to this space. Thank you so much.